last couple of months, I've had three pastor friends that I know that have resigned. They've left the ministry. They've quit. For me, that's not an option. As Laurie said, it's hard for us to understand because we have such a great church that we love so much with all of our heart. It is a privilege, it is an honor, it is a joy to be your pastor. When the video started, I was looking down, getting ready to walk on stage, and my wife had to hit me and say, look at the video. And I say that to say there are some times that I have to look up and remind myself just how blessed I am. Just how blessed I am. We have a wonderful church with wonderful people that love Jesus and love us, and I want you to know that we love you. And you don't have to buy me a wide-body Hellcat for me to love you, but I would love you more. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing. I'm not. <laughs> but thank you so much. And, and, and let me say this. I thank you for your appreciation. But I also want to say that it is my joy and honor to be your pastor because I have the opportunity to work with the greatest staff there is. They make it good for me. They make it exciting. They make it joyful for me to be your pastor. From all of our directors and our coordinators and to our team leaders and especially to all of our volunteers, Guys, if you only knew, I brag about you all over the country and all over the world. I brag about you guys and how much of it is it a joy to be your pastor. 14 years, baby doll. 14 years. I have been your pastor and it's been the greatest joy of my life. Thank you so, so much. I don't want to preach now. I'm going to, but I don't want to. Thank you again. That y'all just know how to get me, don't you? That that my mother at the end there, my gracious, you just can't do that to a son and expect him not to lose it. And um, praise the Lord. I uh, love you guys. I'm trying to go to my sermon. I just can't hardly do it. But we love you guys and thank y'all so much. Do me a favor. If you show me appreciation today, do me a favor. As you're leaving, all of our staff, David, Misty, Siobhan, Kyle, um, Kenny, Abby, uh, Levi, if you'll do me a day at Vaz, if you'll do me a favor today, go by and hug on them too. Love on them. Tell them how appreciative you are of them for all that they do in this church. Amen. 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 Give me a hand. Last night, we were at uh, Walmart, my favorite place in the world. My wife texted me. She was on her way home. from. I had meetings in Oklahoma City this week, and I had to come home early. I had a funeral yesterday and, and a meeting in the morning. And I'll tell you about that meeting at the end of service today. And Laura, as we're sitting in the Walmart parking lot, she looks at me and goes, what are you thinking? I said, nothing. You ever do that? You know you're lying because you're thinking something. A little while later, while I sit in the parking lot, she goes, what are you thinking? I said, nothing, honey. I'm, I'm thinking about my sermon. Saturdays, my wife will tell you I'm gone. I am no good to the family. I'm really not. My mind is on the sermon, preparing for you guys. Is it going to be good? What can I fix and make it better? No matter how far in advance, I actually already had the sermon prepared. But as I'm Saturday, I just have to go over in my mind over and over again. But I thought about that later on, and it, and it ties into my sermon today. Here's my question. What are you thinking? Right now, if I could pop a little bubble above your head and see what you're thinking. <laughs> I don't know what Brandy was thinking right then, but it wasn't good because Brandy goes, <laughs> it wasn't good. What if I could right now pop a bubble above your head and see what you're thinking? How about not right now, but how about this week? What has been your thoughts? What has been those things that have run through your mind? And 
It says in Proverbs 23, 7. This is not my main scripture, but I want to say it. In Proverbs 23, 7, it says this. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. That's in the King James Version. I don't know if that's, yeah. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Do you know that your thoughts will eventually create who you are? I looked up some statistics this week. Uh, they did a study a while back, the National Science Foundation. And it said this, it was found that the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Now remember, the average person sleeps 6.8 hours a day, which leaves 17.2 hours a day to think. So if that be the case, that means we have anywhere between 698 to 3,488 thoughts per hour. Now there's some of you, you're like, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm not even thinking of nothing right now. But if you're like me, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I probably think, 3,500 thoughts an hour. I do. My mind never stops going. That means, on average, you're looking at between 12 to 58 thoughts per minute. Of those thoughts, 80%, another study was done by Cornell University, and they said this, of those thoughts, 80%, 80% were negative. And 95% were exactly the same repetitive thoughts you had the day before. Think about that for a second. There was another interesting study that said this, 85% of what we worry about will never happen. You've heard me say that before. But, even, I, but listen to this study. 85% of what we, we're worried about will never happen. Secondly, with the 15% of the worries that did happen, 79% of the subjects discovered that either they could handle the difficulty better than they expected or that the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. In other words, the conclusion was this. 97% of our worries are baseless and result from an unfounded pessimistic perception. 97%. But yet 80% of your thoughts are negative and bad. But yet 97% of those negative thoughts will never happen. Or if they do, they're not as bad as you thought. Pastor, why are you talking about this? As we conclude this sermon series on mind monsters, I want you to understand the power of your mind. Hear from a person that struggles with thoughts. I do. I read into everything. I read into everything. I do. But if we can train our minds, we can change our lives. If we can train our minds, we can change our lives. Here's my main passage today. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 6. Mark chapter 2, verse 6. I don't have a lot of time. I got to hurry. My wide body hellcat's waiting outside. <laughs> now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now listen to this. I want you to understand this. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Do you know that God knows what you're thinking? Now I do want to say something to you real quick so you know the truth. Here's the truth. The devil does not know your thoughts unless you speak them. But God knows all your thoughts. The Bible actually says, if you thought it, you've done it. He goes on and he says this. Why are you thinking these things? 
which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. There's a reason why that passage is right there. In full view of the ones that were complaining, being negative, thinking bad thoughts. God did it just to show them your thoughts are wrong. It's almost like God healed them, forgave them, and he dropped the mic. This amazed everyone. And they praise God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word that we're about to receive. And I pray you bless it to the hearts and minds of each and every one that hear it today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to run through this quickly. Is that all right? What's happened is they're in Capernaum. Everybody's heard about Jesus and they all come to this house that he's there in Capernaum at. What takes place is there are four friends, and I, I don't have time to preach on this today, but I pray and wish that all of us had four friends like this. There's a man that is paralyzed, can't walk, and four friends are determined they're going to get this man to Jesus. They can't get in because it's so packed, so what they do is they climb to the top of the house, they rip an op open top of the house, and they begin to lower their friend in the front of Jesus. In the front of Jesus, that's some good friends. At that moment, Jesus says, "Son, your sins are forgiven." At that moment, it infuriates the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law were not there to see the good things Jesus was doing; they were there to complain about what Jesus was doing. At that moment, Jesus kind of stops. He looks at them and says, "I know why, what you're thinking. Why are you thinking that? Which is harder?" For me to say his sins are forgiven or get up and walk. Which one? Because I am God and either one I can do. After Jesus says that, he turns back to the man. He says, get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. You're healed. And the man in full view of all of them get up and walk away. I, I tell you this today because there's three things I want to share with you real quick I want you to write down. Number one, bad thoughts create bad truths. Bad thoughts create bad truths. Listen to this. Now, some teacher of the law is sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God? See, the problem was they didn't know the truth, and the truth was God was standing right there before them. What happens is we start believing negative things, and we get negative thoughts in our minds, and what happens is they start creating our truths. Not the truth, not what the truth really is, but they create our truth. I'll never amount to anything. I'll never get beyond the sin that I've committed in my past. No one will ever love me or accept me. This is the best it will ever get. And we start believing those truths, which are not truths from God, but are truths from our bad thoughts. So that's why Jesus had to correct him. Hey, whoa, which is harder, man. I know your thoughts. You don't have to say it out loud. I know what's going on. We have to somewhere within our life stop the bad thoughts that are running rampant through our minds. We've got to take all of our thoughts into the obedience of Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 12 verse 21 says it this way. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, let me put it another way. Don't be overcome by your evil thoughts. Overcome your evil thoughts by thinking good thoughts. I won't say it's going to be easy. You know, walk in, Brian says something mean to me. He's sarcastic. The thoughts will start to flow. Well, who's he think he is? I'm way better than Brian. He don't look as good as me. He ain't as smart as me. He likes those Dallas Cowboys. Who can be, who, what good can come out of Dallas Cowboy fans? It's just an example. Just an example. Not truth. My truth, but not truth, okay? 
See, the Bible says that we have to take all our thoughts captive. In other words, we have to reach into our mind with that thought that is flowing and grab a hold of it and pull it down and say, does it line up with the Word of God? Nope, you're gone. Does it line up with this purpose for my life? Mm, nope, you're gone. That we overcome our evil thoughts with God's good thoughts. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says it this way. We demolish arguments and every petition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Demolish. You know, I want you to do it. You know, I always give you a little tidbit to do every week. Remember that? A little application. This is what I want you to do this week. When some bad thoughts fill your mind that are not godly thoughts or from God, I want you to do this. Wherever you're at, work, home, driving down the road, I want you to take out that thought. Just grab your mind like you're pulling it out. Just go, mm. And the Bible says I'm to demolish it. I want you to take a, mm, and I want you to throw it down and go, <laughs> I'm tired. It will make my week to be driving down the road and she, Charlie, on the, he pulled over, got out of the car. Maybe him and y'all just got in a fight or fuss. And he knows the thoughts in his mind aren't good. And he pulls over and he pulls out that thought, throws it on the ground, and starts to demolish it. See, your thoughts will eventually become your truths. That's why it's so imperative that your thoughts are the thoughts of Christ and the thoughts of God. Here's another one. Write this down. Misconceptions give way to missed opportunities. How many times have you missed out on something great? How many times have you missed out on something good? Because you had a preconceived idea that was actually a misconception because of the truths that you have created. Listen to what he says. Immediately. Do you know Jesus wants to stop your thoughts immediately? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. See, this man was not the only one that could have been healed there that day. This man isn't the only one that could receive grace from God that day. But because of their misconceived ideas and thoughts, the teachers of the law are about to miss out on an opportunity to either have their sins forgiven or be healed in their body. How many times have you come to church with a misconceived idea? Well, that Pastor John, somebody's told him about what I did. That's why he's preaching on it. He's just saying, right, listen, I don't ever hear what y'all do. I don't want to hear what y'all do. I don't want to think about what y'all do. I, I literally had a lady one year leave our church because she said you were preaching to me. Someone told her, I said, I was not preaching to you. I've had that happen numerous times. And then I went back and said, you're wrong. I probably was preaching to you. But it wasn't because of my knowledge. It was because of God's knowledge. Amen. I've had that happen on many occasions. Or you come and say whatever thing you make up in your mind. But you miss out. See, what I would encourage you to do when you walk in the house of the Lord, get every misconceived idea out of your mind. Clear your mind and say, God, whatever you have for me today, I'm here for you, Lord. Do it. Do it, Lord. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says it this way. Finally, brothers and sisters. So, Pastor, what do I think about? Here we go. Whatever is true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy about these such things, you should think. If what you're thinking will not fit in these eight words, get it out of your mind. Jealousy is not from God. In fact, jealousy is a sin. Amen? 
Anger can come a sin. Now listen, be angry and sin not. Listen, it's not the anger that's, that, that's a sin. It's what you do with the anger that becomes a sin. It's coveting. Say, man, I, I really want that house that they have. Or I, I really want that car. I really wish my wife was like her, his wife, or whatever it may be, just like my wife. Did y'all see my wife's shirt today? Yeah. Ain't that cool? Dibs on the pastor. Did y'all see that? I thought that was pretty cool. You got dibs, baby. <laughs> see, you will have to fight the resistance of your mind to take you to places that you don't belong. Well, it's my mind. You're right. You can go anywhere you want with your mind. And guess what? That's probably where your life will go. Anywhere. But not where God wants it to be. See, most of you haven't taken time to take what you think and line it up with the Word of God. Most of you, well, I have a right. I hear this all the time. Well, I've got a righteous anger. No, you don't. You're just angry. It's not a righteous anger. You're just angry. Well, I have the right to look at the beauty of God. Not when you're looking at another woman that ain't your wife. Well, God created her not for you to look at. Someone write this, some guy right now, you're saying, thank God they can't see my thoughts. <laughs> Here's the third thing. I'm running out of time. Negative thoughts produce negative outcomes. Period. I wish that for some of you, you could see yourself the way God sees you. You were never designed to be mediocre. You were never designed just to be enough. You were never designed just to get by, barely make it, and barely survive. You have been believing lies of the devil that you deserve what you got or what you're getting. You believe the lies of the enemy that said you'll never do any better than this. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, it says this, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from a thorn bush or grapes from, a, from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. That means his thought, his mind. See, the reason why some of you aren't seeing success in your life or blessings in your life or joy or peace in your life is because it starts with your mind first. And in your mind, there's no joy, there's no peace. In your mind, you just think you're barely going to make it. In your mind, listen, your mind, your negative mind takes you to negative places. Now, some of you may need help. You may just sit down with some of the Bible says, seek the counsel of the wise. You may just sit down with someone and let's talk about your faults. You believe what your mama and your daddy told you all your life that you never amount to anything. The only reason they told you that was because they never amounted to anything. And they try to put on you what they thought about themselves. It was unfair, it wasn't right, and it wasn't godly. But somewhere along the line, you've got to stand up and say, I'm a child of the Most High God, and He's got great things in store for me. Oh, if I could just take your thoughts today. See, God loves you this morning. And he knows everything about you, even your thoughts. For the last month, we've talked about mind monsters. 
it's time to get rid of the anger and the negativity. It's time to get rid of the, the thoughts that you'll never amount to anything. It's time to get rid of the thoughts that are not of God. See, sometimes our thought becomes our self-appointed punishment. Well, I deserve to keep thinking this. I deserve to hold myself hostage. So the Bible says, if you don't forgive those who sin against you, God cannot forgive you. Do you know that applies to you too? You are not God, so you don't have the right not to forgive yourself. Yes, you screwed up. Yes, you made a big mistake. Yes, it was horrible. But can I tell you that God is bigger than your horrible mistakes? So this week, we start this week. See, some of you, most of your life, you've been afraid of what's behind the doors. Just like kids are afraid of the monster in the closet. We've been afraid of the monsters in our minds. What if they come true? What if people knew? What if people just knew what I was thinking? Listen, it's time to say I am in control of my mind by the power and authority of Christ Jesus. And I won't live this way anymore. I want you to stand with me. We want to thank you so much for joining us for our service today. We hope that you've enjoyed it. Before we let you go today, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. And over 2,000 years ago, God the Father gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die upon a cross for you. That through His death, you would have eternal life. And through the shedding of His blood, you would have forgiveness of all your sins of past, present, and even future. So if you're watching right now, and you're right now living in a life of shame, sadness, and sin, I want to introduce you to my Savior. All you have to do today to be saved is first admit that you're a sinner in need of God's grace and wonderful love. Believe that He is the Son of the living God, died upon a cross for you, rose on the third day, and lives forevermore at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. And with your mouth, confess the Lord of your life, and you shall be saved. So if you're watching right now, and as I'm saying these words, it's touching something in your heart, and you say, today, I want to give my heart life to Christ, then I want you to say this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins and all of my ways. I ask you to come into my heart and into my life. I repent of my ways, and I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life forever and ever. Amen. Man, if you just said that prayer with me, I want you to know that you are a child of God. Your sins have been washed away. You're a new creation, the Bible says, and eternity with Christ is your reward. Do us a favor. If you gave your heart and life to Christ today, please let us know in the comments or reach out to the church, and we would like to tell you your next steps in following Christ Jesus. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you guys for joining us here at Compassion Church Online. If God has done anything amazing in your life, a story that you want to share, make sure that you comment below and let us know. We hope that you guys have a great week and we'll see you here next weekend.